Hello everyone, my name is Becky Robinson and I'm so thrilled to be here today with Dawn Graham who has joined us to talk about her new book, Switchers, which is available this week from HarperCollins Leadership. Welcome Dawn. Hi, great to be here. Uh, so I'm so thrilled to introduce Dawn to all of you. Uh, Dawn is a licensed psychologist. She is also um, a former corporate recruiter and she is the career director for the MBA program for executives at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. She also runs a Sirius XM radio show called Career Talk, and she regularly writes for Forbes.com. So uh, Dawn, I'm so excited with you to learn today. And uh, for those of you who are watching, we're gonna turn off our cameras and uh, move right into the content and, uh, in the slides with you today. So oh, as we get started, Don, you have a very unique vantage point due to hosting Career Talk on Sirius XM Radio and also your role as career director for the Executive MBA program at Wharton. So I'm wondering if you can share with us what trends that you're seeing in job seekers today. Yes, I think people, Becky, really want to be be inspired by their work or at least find meaning in it. And the stats on the screen represent somewhat of the dissatisfaction people are feeling in their jobs. So only 14% of Americans are currently employed in their ideal job. And 52% of Americans report being unhappy at work. And some of the, the, the numbers out there report this stat being as high as 80% because people just aren't interested in what they're doing day to day. And the last number has a lot of meaning to me because it it's about MBA students in particular, which is the group that I work with, and 64% of MBAs are going back to school to actually make a career switch, and this is steadily increasing. And as the career director at Wharton's EMBA program, it's pretty common to see more than half of our 225 students each year coming in to seek a change. So what do all these stats mean, and, and does it matter? I mean, you could think of it and say, well, it's work, and do we really deserve to be happy at work? or should we just be happy to settle for a paycheck? But when you look at the broader picture and you see that professionals in the U.S. work on average 47 hours or the equivalent of what is six days a week and you know, basically log more hours than our counterparts in similar economies around the world. And plus we only have half the vacation days and, we, and at that we only take half of those vacation days. Well, yeah, I think we, we deserve to feel satisfied in the work that we're doing. So, you know, one of the reasons that I created Switchers is because, you know, what we know in the trends today is that the the market is pretty ripe for making a change. Many people have heard about things like the gig economy or portfolio careers or side hustles. And you know, these are different ways of working. And the average tenure actually in a role is only 4.2 years. So the market's very accepting of switchers. What is unfortunate is that hiring practices have not caught up with this. So the systems that we use are really trying to draw as many people as possible, as many applicants as possible. And what they're doing is they're, they're looking for kind of the traditional backgrounds so the traditional skills. And so what's happening is if you're trying to switch, you're getting weeded out. And that's where this book comes in because yeah, while people are always going to be focused on compensation and that's going to be important, what people are looking at now is really being okay with making some sacrifices to find that meaningful work. And, you know, Switchers is a book that I'm hoping will help a lot of people make that transition. Really, really helpful, Dawn. And um, so how difficult do you find that it is for people to make that career switch? So professionals are becoming much more agile. And as we just talked about, the, the hiring practices, unfortunately, are not. So you've probably heard of things like applicant tracking systems and, you know, all of these things that actually weed out candidates. And, you know, a lot of resumes don't even get to human eyes these days. And, and even traditional job seekers are facing those, those hurdles. But, you know, you really can't succeed as a switcher if you're kind of following the basic traditional online applications that we've all really come to to know and, and practice. Yes, they feel productive, and I get that, but 
it makes it um, nearly impossible for a switcher to even get considered. So level of difficulty in terms of a switch can depend on, on really the type of switch you're making. So what you're seeing on screen is a chart that really defines the different levels of switching with the least challenging being the green box, which talks about really the traditional job seekers step-by-step -step process of, of what we've always thought to be a, a you know 30-year career in a given in a given profession so the book doesn't really focus on this one because what it really is focusing on those more difficult switches like the second switch which is an industry switch and this is a little bit more challenging this is somebody who is maybe looking to stay in a similar function but move to a different industry and then you move up to the purple box, which is, is a functional switch. And somebody who's trying to make a functional switch is actually trying to do something that is completely different. So maybe you're a lawyer, but you're deciding that you want to move into a human resources role. And I had a client who was doing that. And that's a, that's a pretty big case to make to a hiring manager who is going to look at you as an apple when they're looking for an orange. And then, of course, the double switch, which is the red box, is, is pretty challenging because now you're trying to make a functional switch and an industry switch. So the book talks about ways to, to make these switches. And the reason this chart is really important, Becky, is because you really need to build a strategy around the level of difficulty of your switch. And I know the language might seem a little bit strong on this chart, but it's really more in reference to the market, not the job seeker. And what I mean by that is a double switch is completely possible, but your strategy has to be spot on. And, you know, we already know the traditional processes won't work. So what this book does is it really helps you develop a process that will get you to your switch and it's it's not at all like the traditional processes that you're used to looking at of course it's not effortless but it will open the doors to the opportunity that you want so do you have a story about that don so yes, I can I can definitely talk about um, the the uh, lawyer who made a switch to um, to a double switch. And just as a you know another example, we see military making this type of switch. So they're looking to to leave and exit the military and go to a completely different industry and a completely different function. But um, you know, we had a, uh, one of my clients was a, a lawyer who was looking to move into HR. And this is obviously a major switch. And not only was she looking to do that, but she wanted to move from a pharma company into more of a startup type of environment, which is a very different industry. So um, one of the things that we did, and I'll talk about this actually, um, you know, coming up is she did a stepping stone switch. And what that is, is instead of going directly from um, you know the, the being a lawyer in pharma to to being a uh, an HR person in tech, she moved into an HR role in her current firm and got those skills, and then a couple of years later moved into the startup. And so so these switches are very possible. It's just a matter of what your resources are and what your um, you know your, your ability to put together a strategy. And I think that's something that a lot of job seekers skip. Is is that strategy piece and I kind of look at it as the um, you know when you go to Ikea and you get a uh, you know a set of bookshelves and you just dive right in versus laying out all the pieces and making sure you have all the right screws and and bolts and that's what this book really helps you do is lay out the strategy look at it in light of your resources your connections your time and build something that's going to enable you to get to your goal well, let's talk a little bit about what someone might need to do to make that double switch. So yeah, so um, the double switch is something that a lot more people are pursuing and we're seeing it um, again in the, the MBAs and you know, a lot of people feel like, oh, in order to make a double switch, the first thing I should do is, is go back to school and get a degree. But I really caution people against this being the first step. I'm not saying that education isn't going to be helpful, but what we do know is that it's a big time investment, it's a big money investment. And if it's your first step and you haven't really laid 
laid out the strategy and you haven't really checked out the market and done your research, it could lead you in a direction that's not where you want to go. So for example, I had a client who went to school to be a speech therapist for two years. And at the end of those two years is when she, she kind of came to me as a client and she realized, I don't think I want to do this. And you know, after spending two years of, of intense, you know, um, effort and, you know, tests and, and clinical work, you know, she realized that this was not the career she wanted. So I think that's one of the first things you need to do when you're making a double switch is really look at the target market, um, look at the skills you bring and look at the connections that you have. I kind of like to joke that if, you know, the double switch becomes a lot less challenging if your uncle is the CEO in the firm you're targeting, but since most of us aren't lucky mm-hmm. enough to have that, the book walks you through really how to delve into these um, into your skills and how to understand them in terms of the target audience's pain points or challenges. So um, one of the big things that a double switcher needs to do is to really rebrand their value. And you know, this can be tough if you've not really spent a lot of time branding in general. So the book walks through how to create what I call brand value proposition and how to specifically target it to your new audience. And, you know, as we talked about a few minutes ago, a straight up double switch can be difficult. So it talks about the different types of stepping stone switches that you might want to do. So the client I mentioned a few minutes ago decided to make a change internally in her company, get the functional skills and then change industries. And you can do it a number of different ways. So you might decide that you want to, um, you know, if, if you can't, uh, if you can't spend another day in your company for whatever reason, you might decide to move, in her case as an example, to be, um, you know, to, to move to a different company and then move within that company. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. And I think, again, that's where that strategy becomes really important. Well, so we have a question that's come into the chat that's on this topic of double switching. And Jay says he's an engineer by training and a certified team leader and leadership coach, trainer, and speaker. Um, and he's exploring a move to either consulting or, and to HR within the current or organization and pursuing an MBA since his formal education has primarily been technical. And he's wondering, are there any recommendations you have or, and does the book cover that type of scenario? So just let me clarify, Becky. So engineer um, in, a, in a large firm looking to move into, did you say HR? Um, it looks like either consulting or HR within the same organization. That sounds like a single switch. <laughs> yeah, and and he's um, and he's getting an MBA. So yeah, this is where um, th- this is where the book would be perfect because you know one of the things that people are are concerned about is how do I get this functional experience and maybe what I need to do is actually leave my organization. And sometimes the best place to make a double switch um, is to start within your organization. And it doesn't even sound like this is a double switch. It sounds like it's just moving into a different function. If you've proven yourself in an organization and they have a history of you getting good performance reviews or you've, you've done some great networking and you've built up some credibility in your organization, they're going to want to try and retain you. And if they're going to retain you, one of the ways that might be possible is to help you move into a different function where you can apply your skills differently. The book still talks about that you have to rebrand yourself and you have to be able to um, market yourself to the new team or part of the organization in a way that shows how you solve their pain points. But I think that's actually one of the best places to start with a switch is in an organization where you've already built up some social capital and some credibility and can show them how you can take that either industry experience or experience with the um, the company and being successful within the culture of that company and move it to a different department. Thanks. That's really helpful. And uh, Jay, I think that we can probably circle back. So Don, can we talk for a few minutes? I know your uh, background is in both recruiting and, and psychology, which is exceedingly unique. And in the book, you incorporate these psychological principles that are important to understand in the search process. Can you share a few of those with us? Sure. So psychology is such a big part of 
pretty much all human interactions and business transactions, especially the hiring process. And that's why I decided to study it further. So I think the main thing to know is that the hiring process is inherently biased. When humans are involved, whether they're interviewing candidates or, you know, or programming one of those applicant tracking systems I mentioned earlier, there's bias. And, you know, for a switcher, the biggest hurdle is being viewed as an outsider since you know you're a non-traditional candidate and you don't have the expected background that a hiring manager is looking for so the trick and this is what the book talks about is becoming part of that in group to overcome this bias and the best way to do that is by engaging your network now i know most job seekers hear this advice all the time <laughs> um, however for switchers it's crucial and the book goes into specifically how to create ambassadors that will help you get past these biases. And you know, for those listening, I'll just give you a quick exercise. Um, if you just take take about 10 seconds to look at everything in your environment right now that's that's red. So if you're in a room, look at everything that's red. Signs, books, posters, clothing, and, and remember it. Okay. Now close your eyes. And I want you to remember as many objects as you can that are green. Now that's probably pretty hard to do. And this is a great example because I think this is what hirers do. They have these blinders on when your resume comes in and you're not a traditional candidate and the rest just kind of fades into the background. So switchers really need to present themselves in a way that they can get noticed even when they don't have the right titles in their background. And, and that's what this book helps you do. Another psychology principle that strongly influences hiring is loss aversion. And loss aversion is the tendency to weight losses more than gains of the same value. So I'll give you an example. If human resources told you you'd be getting an extra $200 in your paycheck, you'd probably be happy for a few hours, maybe even have a special dinner. But if they told you you'd be taking, they'd be taking $200 out of your paycheck, you'd likely be, be upset maybe for weeks and maybe even hold a grudge. And, you know, this type of response, if you think about it, it, you can probably think of other scenarios where it happens in your life. But this is rooted in biology since avoiding losses is a key part of survival. And this is an instinct that really remains strong today. Hiring man managers want to avoid losses associated with the bad hire and these can be money time resources or reputation and this is why they tend to go with the safe candidate which is the traditional candidate um, so it's important to really understand these things about the hiring process and processes and i spend a whole chapter talking about it because once you start to really understand what's going on on the other side of the desk you can start to use that to your advantage and one of the things i coach people all the time is that the hiring process is not about selection but it's about elimination. I think that's really important. It's not about selection, it's about elimination. And this shift in mindset can really help you change your entire strategy in terms of being a job seeker. And what I mean by this is if you think about it, when a job ad gets posted, 250 people are you know, already like on the ball applying online and a hiring manager usually can only hire one person so if they can only hire one person their goal is to really eliminate people and some of the the low-hanging fruit which might be individuals with gaps in their in their resumes or people don't have the right titles which would be a switcher those are easy to get um, lost and rejected in the in the system and that's what we're trying to avoid by this book is to really get you seen and the book also includes psychological principles that really help switchers to convince hires to take a chance on them so one example of a strategy that's in the book is something called reversible decisions and reversible decisions is is kind of a cool concept that you've probably experienced in in retail stores so some retail stores have these great return policies and they do this because they know that having the ability to change your mind will increase the likelihood that you're going to make a purchase. They also know through research that it's really unlikely you're going to return that. And so you can use this same strategy in, in your switch, but also in day to day. So for example, say you want to work from home for one day 
each week. You can go to your boss and use this reversible decision concept and say, you know, I'd, it'd be great for my, my work-life balance to work from home one day a week. Can we try this for three months and then reassess at that time? And if it's not working, we'll go back to the previous way it was. So even apprehensive bosses are likely to agree and see that, it, you know, at the end of the three months, it works out. So you know, these strategies are a way that switchers can approach their job search to really open more doors. And, and that's kind of, um, that's actually part of chapter two that goes into all of these different things. And it's one thing from being a corporate recruiter that I can offer to, to job seekers is that when you start to understand what's going on on the other side of the desk, you start to have much more advantage in your job search. That's super helpful. Um, now, I know that you talk in the book about Plan A, Don. Can you tell us what a Plan A is and why it's so important? So Plan A is essentially your job switch target defined very specifically. And, and it's at the intersection of your skills, interests, and the market, which is what this, this graphic is showing. And I'll share a little secret on this webinar, Becky, that the original title of the book was actually Forget Plan B because this concept is so important and central. But, um, you know, market research came back showing that that title had multiple meetings. So I, I decided to change it, which is another another good plug for doing your research. But um, the reason for Get Plan B was so central to this is because a well mapped out Plan A is is going to do um, a number of things. I mean, first off. It's, it's helpful to your rebranding. You really need to rebrand yourself in a way that shows you appeal to your new audience, not your old audience. And the traditional way we've all learned to do a job search is, um, you know, we, we look at our history, we pick out our accomplishments, and it's kind of a historical account. And that's not what this book talks about because your history isn't going to be necessarily what your new audience wants to see. Um, so, so it's important for the, the rebranding piece. But another thing is, is that it's really important to understand your plan A at, at a deep level because sometimes the career you're going for isn't exactly what you thought it would be. So, so thinking about the example I mentioned earlier about the speech therapist, but at Wharton, we see a lot of our executive students interested in strategy consulting. And as they do more research around it, they realize that this is a career that's going to take them on the road 80% of the time. And they think, well, you know, with the other things that I'm going on in my life, this isn't really where I want to be. So really understanding your plan A, understanding the market, understanding, you know, what your interests are and, and what your values are and how they apply to the job you're, you're thinking about and the skills you bring is going to help you make a good decision so that you don't invest a lot of time and energy only to find out on the other side that this isn't what you thought it would be. And then I really talk about going all in 100% on your plan A. And this scares people a little bit because they think, well, I should have a backup plan. I should, you know, what if this doesn't work out? And there's a lot of research out there that shows that when you have a fallback plan, a plan B, you actually tend to use it. And so that's one reason to commit 100%. But the, the even more important reason, I think, is that if you're wavering at all as you're networking, um, or as you're interviewing, then, you know, we know confidence breeds confidence. So if you're not confident, why should somebody roll the dice and hire you if you're kind of wavering and feel like you need a backup plan? So, so there's an aspect to it that is so important psychologically. And here's what we know that you inherently do have a backup plan because if for some reason your switch doesn't work or you change your mind, you've come from a successful background and you can always return to that career if you want. But if you don't commit 100%, you're never going to know if your switch is possible. And I think this is where a lot of people um, kind of decide to quit and throw in the towel because they don't go all in and when they're, they don't go all in, they don't get to it and they think, well, it's me and I don't have the skills to do this. When in fact, it, it, that's probably probably not the case. What probably it was is your job search strategy was more of a traditional job search strategy versus a switcher job search strategy. So if you can change that, including mapping out this plan A, you're going to be much more successful in getting to where you want to be. 
Well, that uh, point that you made, Don, about going all in uh, in order to create confidence in the hiring manager is really powerful. So um, we've heard all of us about networking as an effective strategy um, in a lot of career books. But um, in Switchers, you talk about creating ambassadors. What do you mean by this, Don? So networking has been the gold standard for finding new employment for decades, literally decades. And I'm a big advocate of it as well as a big introvert. And, and I think my point in sharing that I'm a huge introvert is that networking is not something that comes naturally to me at all. And I did my dissertation research on how introverts and extroverts approach the job search differently using networking. And one of the, the big things I've learned is that, you know, there's a, there's a time in my life when I thought if I have, if I put my, my skills um, all in and I, I achieve a lot, you know, I can, I can get past this networking piece and I don't need to do it. But what I've learned through doing my dissertation as well as through a, a decade of spending focused time on networking is that it's really difficult to achieve a certain level without the help of others. But the reason I point out that I'm an introvert and networking doesn't come naturally to me is because I know that's the case for a lot of people who are listening. And I want you to know that this book is written with that in mind. So I'm, I'm not going out there with the rah, rah, everybody can network and it's great. And, you know, just get out there and, and throw yourself in it. It's, it's, it's definitely, um, much more focused to people like myself who look at networking as, as somewhat of a difficult and not very natural activity. So there are a lot of great books out there that are entirely dedicated to networking, which I reference in the book. And Switchers has two chapters that really focus on this and the, the aspects of networking that are most critical to the career changer. And the first has to do with really mobilizing the network you already have and you know, there's a lot of mystery around networking, but the fact is we already have a network. And I think that's an important point is that you're not creating one from, from scratch. You have a network and Switchers really talks about capitalizing on that network that you already have. So the people who are ready in your life and, and, you know, two quick uh, examples of this are you know, one would be called dormant contacts and these are your contacts who have gone cold so just a personal example a, a former colleague reached out to me about two months ago I haven't talked to her in in probably about 11 years and we reconnected and we went for coffee and you know no no agenda for either of us just hey you know let's we haven't seen each other let's get together for coffee and we wound up having such a good time and so much more in common now than we had back then and this is a great example of a dormant contact. Somebody who, um, you know, I haven't talked to in a while, but I had a great relationship with at one point and, and the connection was reestablished. We all have people like that in our lives, either maybe people we went to school with or maybe people we've worked with previously at different companies. And so these are a great way to really engage the network that you already have. And you know, something else that I talk about in the book is second level contacts and second level contacts would be the people your contacts know. And I think this is a very big, um, area of potential for most people and one that's often overlooked because even my executive students say, oh, I need to find people in this industry or I need to find people with this background. And the fact is, is that a lot of people you know and see every day and already have relationships with know people in those backgrounds. And so you can't really underestimate anybody because you don't know who your neighbor's cousin is or who, you know, where dentist's spouse works. And sometimes these are the connections, you know, the people right in your own backyard who can put you in touch with people who can make your career switch a reality. And so I think that's really important. And I talk a lot about that strategy in the book. The second chapter on networking has to do with this creating ambassadors, which isn't really what people think about when they're networking in a job search. But in reality, it's actually the entire purpose. Ambassadors aren't just people you know. Ambassadors are people who will advocate for you, who have the language to be able to sell you to other people who um, are able to bring relevant information back to you. And that is so important because you can't be everywhere as a job seeker. And one example that I love to throw out there is, is think about the people closest to you. And be honest with yourself. You don't have to, to share it with anyone. But can they verbalize clearly 
what you do in a sentence or two. And I'm not talking about your title or your company, but I'm talking about the problems you solve for others. And I'm talking about the, the people who are maybe your roommates or your um, siblings or your children or your parents or people who know you likely can't advocate for you because they don't know what you do. And so when you start to develop a solid strategy and a solid plan A and rebrand yourself, which are all things the book teaches you to do, you can share that with the people who care about you most and they can be out there being ambassadors for you. But most of us miss this because the people who are closest to us, either they don't know exactly what we do or what we, we're looking for, or in some cases we're, we're not allowing ourselves to be vulnerable enough to share it with them because we're just assuming since they're not in our industry or field, they can't help us. So the book really focuses on how you can take what you already have and maximize that to land your switch. So we have a question from someone on the call uh, regarding networking and uh, what he says is that um, networking comes naturally to him when he doesn't need people's help. So he's able to make a ton of ambassadors when he's not in need, but he finds it challenging to make an ask when it's time to activate those connections. So do you have any advice for how to make that ask with your pro professional connections? Yes, and um, it's so funny uh, that you say that because there's actually a, a place in the book that talks about the ask, and I use an example of my own where I was on a board of directors, and I loved advocating for this organization, but the part of the job that I, I did not like was asking people for donations. So yes, you're absolutely right. You have to get to the ask, and the reason why it's so different when you're, you're talking to people and networking not for your job, you're certainly talking about things like, oh, can I, you know, do you have a good Italian restaurant you can recommend? Or I need a vet for my new dog. And those things are easy because they're not connected to our identity. And often our careers are a very core part of who we are. So when we start to need to ask for help around who who we are, our, our jobs, we all of a sudden become much more vulnerable. And the book, the book talks about this and some strategies for getting over it, depending on where this is rooted. Um, but the fact is, is that when you're in a job search, whether you're a traditional candidate or a switcher, you're really never asking for a job. Your your people know that you're having a conversation about your career because your goal at some point is to change jobs. And we also know that if people change jobs on average, just based on the research, every 4.2 years. So the fact is that, um, you know, people are going to be in this networking forever and, and you're going to need help at some point. Other people are going to need help at some point. So people should be constantly talking about jobs. And I think if you haven't been, and if you're looking to make a switch and this is kind of your first foray into this area, the best thing to do is starting with people, you know, because you already have the relationship. So maybe people, maybe you're in a religious organization or maybe you volunteer, or maybe you're, you talk to the parents at your kid's baseball game and you're in these places. The, the big, the biggest thing you can do to help yourself if this is an uncomfortable thing is just shift the conversation to start talking about what you do. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a very simple but often overlooked thing to say, you know, you're talking at your kid's baseball game about, about, you know, what's going on in, in the game, but, you know, you're shifting and saying, you know, we've never really had a chance to talk about, about what you do. I'm really curious about what you do day to day. And, and I think starting with curiosity and asking the other person is a really good way to open it because of course they'll turn around and ask you, and then you can get into a conversation and nowhere in that conversation do you need to ask for a job and nowhere in that conversation do you need to say, um, you know, I'm looking or I'm out of work necessarily. But what you do need to do is communicate very clearly the value you add to your audience, which is your brand value proposition, which we talk about in the book. And if you are looking, your plan A. And again, it's not necessarily asking for a job, but if you find out that you're, you're um, contact or whoever you're speaking with works at a company you're interested in, I mean, this might be a great opening to say, you know, I, I'd love to learn more about this. Is there somebody I can talk to? Or, you know, or maybe you find out their spouse works there. You know, I'd love to learn more about that company. Do you think that I can talk to, to Joan, you know, and set up a time to meet and, and make it develop naturally. I think it's also important not to look at it as a one and done that it's, it, you know, you're going to have a conversation. You don't need to get everything in that conversation. 
and it could be something that's gradual. You can give yourself time and, and that will develop into, um, you know, more contacts, more people, more introductions. And if you already have a relationship, then people are going to be very willing to introduce you. You just have to kind of plant the seed in their head. Hey, it'd be really great to talk to, you know, somebody in that organization. That's really helpful. Um, so Don, you've mentioned a few times on the call this importance of personal branding. And I'm wondering, you know, this is such a popular topic. Um, is it really worth the hype? Yes, absolutely. Um, companies live by their brands because they build trust. I mean, pure and simple, brands build trust and consumers pay more for the exact same product when a brand name is on the label. And this is because we have an emotional connection to the brand. And, you know, this is another piece of psychology. And you'll see this woven throughout the book, which, um, you know, I think when you have these, understand these concepts, it makes the job search so different. Um, emotions play a key role in decision making. And there's research out there that shows when individuals uh, who have brain damage in a certain region uh, of the brain that prevents this emotion, they have difficulty making even simple decisions like what to have for dinner, which is so interesting because the job search has moved so much in the pendulum has swung so much to data and, you know, assessments and other objective measures. But at the end of the day, as scientific as the hiring process may have become, the ultimate decision on who to hire will be biased by emotion. And I think, again, as you know, that if you know this as a job seeker on the other side of the desk, you'll realize why brand is so important. Brand is something that has to do with, with likability and how somebody feels and experiences you as an individual. So yes, I know it's gotten mixed reviews over the last several years in terms of do, does somebody need a personal brand, but I, I don't believe skipping this step makes sense for any job seeker, but much less a switcher. And that's why I love this image. If you're looking at the screen, you may, you may kind of see this image and see that there are, there are many C2 faces, but there's actually three in this image. There's the, the younger woman on the left, and then there's the, the older woman kind of on the, the top right, and then there's the mustache and the nose for, for the gentleman. I love this image because I feel like it represents all of us as professionals. We all have many different types of skills. We have many different types of qualities that we bring to the table. And the reason branding gets so much airtime in this book, because as a switcher, what, what, what I teach you to do is, you know, you look at this picture and all the aspects on the different sides of you, and you have to bring the one forward that is most aligned with your new target. So, so I think this is where, um, you know, the confidence comes in. You probably have the skills to do the job you want. It's just a matter of learning how to present them to your audience in a way that they can see it clearly. And, you know, so for example, I had a client who uh, had a PhD and was working in research and development and um, wanted to move into the corporate side of the business, worked in a, a large um, pharmaceutical company, uh, but continued to get overlooked because of the bias people had about her background. You know, the, the feedback was, oh, clinical types don't belong on the business side. And, you know, and, and unfortunately she kept putting forth her PhD. And I mean, these are great credentials. These are phenomenal credentials. And when, when that's what she put forward, they couldn't see past that. That was the lens they were looking through and they couldn't see her business skills. But when we removed that from her resume and led with more of her marketing, um, her strategic and operational skills, that's when the doors started to open. And that's hard. I'm not going to say that it's easy to take off achievements that you're proud of when you're, you're making a career switch. But the fact is, is you have to sell to your audience and, you know, effective sales professionals know this too, that leading with what the customer wants gets attention. And I can give you an example from, you know, just related to a product. So if you're selling a vehicle to a young family, emphasizing speed and a killer sound system isn't going to be as effective as kind of pointing out the reliability and safety features of the vehicle. Now, both may exist in the same car, but you know, there's a certain one that's going to sell to that young family, and that's the ones you want to put forward in that case. That's a really good point. <laughs> um, well, I want to talk for a few minutes. I'm really curious to hear this from you, Don, about uh, job switch killers. 
Um, in the book, you talk about some of the mistakes that switchers make that you wish you had known before making some of your own career switcher switches. So what are some of those job switch killers? Yeah, the book talks about five of the major ones. And the reason I think this is really important is because we all have a finite amount of energy and resources. And where I see people throw in the towel on a job switch is because they get these rejections and it gets frustrating and they just start to believe I don't have the chops to do this when it's not at all their skills, but it's this, you know, the bias in the, in the job hiring process that really gets in the way. So I think when you kind of go through this list of job switch killers, my goal of putting them in the book is to say, okay, don't waste your time and energy here because you're going to need it for your putting together your strategy and your plan and moving forward. So um, I'm not going to go through all, all of them in the interest of time. Time, but the two I see the most are not engaging your network, which we've already talked about, um, and then relying on traditional job search advice, which we, we've touched on as well. But, you know, I know, trust me, I know <laughs> as a psychologist, it feels so good to sit behind your computer and, um, you know, send out resume after resume and feel like you're, you're being productive. Um, but then there's that crash when you get the negative response or, or worse, no response at all. And you can spend so much time doing this that uh, you know you start to believe you're not qualified. So an additional thing people do is is work with headhunters. I have a lot of people come to me and say, you know, I'm trying to find a headhunter who can help me make the switch. And you know, the fact is, headhunters. Um, there's a couple of things I think people need to know about them. One, they fill very few open roles each year. So maybe 5% out of all the job openings that actually exist. Those roles tend to be very senior or hard to fill positions. And, you know, switchers are probably the worst um, kind of clients for them because they're really looking for people who have 10 to 15 years in a given profession and somebody who's more of a traditional candidate. And, you know, the biggest thing is they work for the company, not the job seeker. So they're getting paid to find somebody who's kind of a perfect match and they're not going to spend their time selling a traditional candidate to their well-paying client. So, you know, switchers don't have the luxury of what I refer to in the book as a reactive job search. What we've always learned, you know, resume, apply online, and you know, phone screen, interview, negotiate. They need to be proactive and create their own process to get them in front of the decision makers. And um, it's it's more ambiguous and challenging, but it leads to the opportunities that aren't going to show up online. Which I, which is why I think this book is worth it for all job seekers, actually, not just switchers. And you know, it's interesting. I I just saw this quote yesterday um, that said people are uh, almost invariably arrive at their beliefs not based on proof but on the basis of what they find attractive and I think this is why so many people continue to apply online even though the research has stated you know over and over and over again that networking is the biggest advantage in a job search strategy so my goal with this book is is to move everybody to a situation where they can open the doors to to these opportunities that they wouldn't see any other way that's helpful, Don. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, once you land the interview, um, what is the most important thing that a switcher can do to be successful in that interview process? So and as a former corporate recruiter, um, I know there are three things that matter in the interview. Um, skills, fit, and motivation. And those are up on the, the screen. And you know, the book talks about these in depth because you need to know how to approach all three. Um, when you get to the interview, you've already proven that you have the skills to do the job. Most hiring managers won't spend additional time with you if you don't. It doesn't mean you can glide as a switcher because traditional candidates actually have a little bit of an advantage here. So you do need to, to prepare. And the book talks about how to prepare for some of the toughest questions you're going to get as a switcher because, um, it, you know, the hiring manager is going to be concerned that you don't have the traditional background. So I want to make sure people understand how to answer those questions in a way that gives the hirer confidence in them. Um, you know, and then there's fit and a lot of hiring managers struggle with defining this, but it really comes down to things like likability and a work style that meshes with the culture and um, you know, how you approach your work. And the greatest part about getting referred into a company by one of your network contacts is it really helps to 
solidify fit. And that's why a lot of companies use employer referral programs because they usually bring in candidates who end up staying. And an interesting stat that I, I talk about is that referrals are through the research the number one source of hiring quality and volume but they only represent about seven percent of applicants so being a referral gives you a huge advantage the last one is motivation and i think this is highly critical and often overlooked you really don't want an underwhelming or generic response to the question why do you want this job at this company at this time and in fact an underwhelming question could actually lose you the offer because Companies want to know you've done your due diligence. They want to know that you want to be at their company, not just any company. They want to know you're not running from a bad situation and just trying to, to get out of it. They want to know that you're really interested in them. And this goes back to loss aversion, that they don't want to be in this process again, you know, hiring somebody in a year. It's, as much as job seekers hate the hiring process, hiring managers dislike it too because it brings them away from their day-to-day -day job and they have to, you know, spend time now interviewing and looking at resumes. So in the book, we talk about creating a career story and it's a response to this question that that's logical, compelling, it shows commitment and, and it's genuine. And all of these pieces need to be there because I'm, I'm convinced that hiring managers hire on this question. It goes back to that, that what we were talking about a few minutes ago, Becky, about the, the emotions that, you know, that's the emotional piece that comes in. Does this person want to be here? And am I going to find myself in a, in a, another search? because this person doesn't stay. So, you know, another thing about that is how you say things in the interview is really important. So just to give you a quick example, you want to avoid things like saying career change or career transition because this distances you from the interviewer and rather you want to use words like, like I want to expand my focus or I want to take the next logical step in, in the career. So the book gets pretty surgical about this because it really matters. Um, you know, if a hiring manager is trying to avoid risk, these small things can make a really big difference um, in the interview. So, uh, Don, one of the questions that I had that came in, which um, I think relates to this, is the added challenge of being a switcher who's re-entering the job market. So, um, can you talk about the added challenge or give some tips to someone who might be trying to re-enter the job market after some time away and has the added complication of making a switch from the previous career path? Yes. So the, the book touches on this as well. I call it the absentee switcher. And there's a lot of reasons people step away from the job market. Um, and, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, the hiring manager wanting to avoid risk. And this is, this is a challenge in of itself. There are companies and books dedicated just to what they call relaunchers or, you know, going back into the job market. So, I mean, a couple of things that I think are very important. I mean, one, depending on how long you've been out, that makes a difference. Um, but one of the most important things if you are going to be out for a while is keeping your network strong, keeping your skills strong. And you can do these in a number of ways. And I'm not going to get into that in the interest of time. But um, when you're looking to get back into the market, this is when, if you're looking to make a switch, this is when a stepping stone switch might be a good option for you as an absentee switcher because you already know the, the market's going to be a little bit nervous about the fact that you've been out of the market for a number of years. And so moving directly into a double switch can add a lot of additional time onto your search. Now, it really depends on your connections and how much resource, how many resources you have. But assuming that you don't have endless connections and endless resources, if you do the stepping stone, so for example, maybe moving back into the industry you were in previously where you have some contacts or maybe even back into a company, like doing a boomerang as we call it, um, you know, that you've worked for and then transitioning within that company, you'll probably get to where you want to be be much faster. The other thing that you can you can definitely use is the reversible decisions strategy that we talked about earlier. I mean, a lot of people want a full-time job right off the bat, and we feel like there's some kind of security in that. 
But the fact is one of the best and most overlooked ways to get a job is to actually go for the temporary roles or the contract roles. And these seem to feel less secure to us because they have an end date. Well, it's only three months or it's only six months. But what a phenomenal way to get into a company, prove yourself, make connections. And, um, you know, the research shows that about half of, of individuals who go this path get hired. And even if you didn't get hired in that company, the contacts you make and the experience you you get is going to go far in your next job search. So do not overlook these, these part-time or temporary or um, other ways to get your foot in the door because the, the hardest part of any job search is getting your foot in the door so you can prove yourself to others. And those are a great way to do it. Thanks, Dawn. So as we get closer to the end of the hour, I'm wondering if you can share with us, you know, um, obviously the title of the book is Switchers. Uh, could you share with us a little bit about how the, the book may be helpful for people who aren't looking to switch careers, but just doing a more traditional job search? I think that's the beauty of this book, Becky, that is if you're not a switcher, the strategies will completely amp up your traditional job search and open the door to many opportunities than what's just advertised online. Um, the image that you have on the screen shows how traditional people higher. And you've, you've probably heard stats like 75% or 80% of jobs are never advertised. Um, and that's because some companies know there's a smarter way. It's also because some companies, maybe smaller to mid-sized companies, don't have the budget to hire and when I say that, they have the budget to advertise and do go through all those hoops. Or some of the, for example, large tech companies, they don't need to advertise because they have people knocking at their door. So most of us, you know, I asked my executive students just to get some, some validation. Most of us hire this way. When we have an open position, we ask. We ask people we know. We ask people who have worked with us before. And it's, it's very common. A lot of people probably on the call have moved positions to work in a new company with somebody they used to work with. If that doesn't work, Work, you might post a job internally just to the employees in that company. That doesn't work. You're going to go to the company website because that's free and it tends to draw people who are interested in your specific company. And if that doesn't work, you're going to go to the online job board. So um, you have to think about what's, what types of jobs are making it to the online job boards. It's probably not the highest paid and most interesting ones. That's not always the case, but if you think about it, um, probably a lot of times Times, that's the case. So you want to get in at the, the lower part of this circle and get in at the networking stage. And I think that's what the strategies in this book teach you to do. Yes, in, in focus of a switcher, but certainly that could work for a traditional candidate as well. Um, and the other thing I think that's particularly universal are the, the psychology concepts that I, are throughout the book. I think it's unique to this book, but I also think knowing about things like loss aversion and understanding that hiring is about elimination and not selection really enables job seekers to gain an advantage by creating a strategy that's, that's more advanced. Um, and, you know, and that's my hope with this book is that, you know, those, those jobs that are not out there advertised online, um, you know, that 80% that's in the hidden network, that the people can find those jobs because often when you find a job through those methods, you tend to be happier, you tend to stay longer. And interestingly, you tend to get paid more because when you, you get in at the lower circles, there's less competition. So um, negotiations can even go better. And so that's my hope with this book, Becky. I really want switchers to open the door to a new way of approaching the job search so that people can, can get to where they want to be. Thank you so much, Dawn. I'm going to turn to some questions from our attendees, and there have been many, so I'm going to do my best to get to as many as I can. Um, earlier on in the hour, Jeff was asking a question about um, what you do when you've been laid off for budget reasons. He said he's been looking for about six months to switch from the nonprofit se sector to the for-profit sector. And he's not um, having as much traction as he would like. And so he's wondering, do you think that getting professional help um, for that would be helpful? 
So yeah, so if you're looking to go from the nonprofit to the for-profit, so that's an industry switch. And I think this book is perfect for that because one of the things you're going to you're going to see in that is bias. There's there's definitely a bias, especially for people who haven't worked in both sectors that um, there's there's stereotypes involved. Well, if you work in in, you know, this sector, you tend to be like this, and if you work in this sector, you tend to be like that. So, um, one of the the reasons for rebranding and not starting out with, for example, your titles or companies, which is what most of us do. I mean, think about it. When you ask somebody, you know, hey, what do you do? And you're meeting somebody, most people answer with a title and a company. And what this book teaches you is that that really gives your power away. And I can give a personal example. If I say I'm a career coach, a lot of people who don't know what a career coach does would assume I'm a headhunter or I'm a recruiter. And that's that's not true. Or if I say I work at Wharton, people automatically assume I'm a finance professor, and that's absolutely not true. Um, <laughs> so I'm giving my power away if I'm using those things. But when I say, you know, I um, I help people rebrand and get in front of the decision makers, and I, I, I do that through helping individuals um, rewrite their resumes and uh, rewrite their LinkedIn profiles so that they are branded towards the market and the jobs that they're looking for. And then I could say I'm a career director at Wharton, that creates a very different scenario. So I think one of the things that that all job seekers should do, and actually all individuals should do, is when you start introducing yourself, really start thinking about um, introducing yourself to new people by the value you add, because it doesn't matter what industry you necessarily do it in, or it doesn't matter what your, your title is in your company, or even what company necessarily you do it at. It's the value you add for your audience. And when you start with that lens, then everything they see kind of goes and funnels through that lens versus when you start with a title it's really easy for them to to focus on what they know of that title or what their stereotypes or biases around that title are and then it's really difficult to get them to change that perception sure so in this case jeff shared also that he had a 23-year nonprofit career from minimum wage up to executive director ceo managing 200 seasonable seasonal employees and uh, budgets up to 5 million and parts of organizations up to 18 million. So it seems like finding a way to focus on um, more of like the size of the organizations that he served uh, rather than the nonprofit status could be helpful for him. I think that is huge. And I mean, I, I, you know, we can't pull people on the call, but I would say the first thing, my first thing somebody hears is nonprofit. You're putting humans, love to categorize. Our brain is designed to categorize because this is how we function every day. This is how we're able to, to do multiple things at once and to um, process things very quickly. And the second, the first thing you say often, the first sentence is the lens or the box in my brain that I'm going to put that in. And everything else is going to be evaluated based on that. And I think if the first thing you say is nonprofit, the, the first thing somebody's going to think is, what do I know about nonprofits? And whatever their biases are against that or for that are going to come out. So when you say that you've managed, you, you've, you've promoted to the top of the organization or you've managed 200 people or you, you've done X number of dollars, and that's the first thing you're saying, I'm, I'm wanting to know more. I'm like, that's interesting. You know, where you did it in this case is less important. Sure. Well, that's really helpful, uh, Dawn. And this has been the most amazing hour with so many amazing resources. And as we come close to the end of the hour, I want to make sure that people know how they can learn more from you, uh, Dawn. So the first thing is you can go today and buy switchers on Amazon or from any of your other favorite booksellers. Uh, you can also sign up for Dawn's free blog at drdawnoncareers.com. And I hope you'll do that. You can also check out her career talk radio on Sirius XM, or you can catch the podcast replays on Google Play or iTunes. And Dawn, I'm going to make a recommendation. There were lots of questions that came in today that we didn't get to. So perhaps those are questions you can address on your show in the future. You can also find and follow Dawn on Twitter. Dawn, is there anything else you wanted to share as a parting thought with our attendees today? 
Yeah, I just wanted to, first off, thank everybody for coming. I know taking an hour out of your day, especially in the summer, is is, um, is very generous. So I appreciate that. And I, I would just say that, you know, my hope with this book and my goal with this book is to really empower job seekers, switchers in particularly, but, but everybody, just from my knowledge of being a corporate recruiter and um, my psychology knowledge, I wanted to share that with people because I really do believe we spend so much time at work that it's important that we feel satisfaction. And I, I hate when job seekers don't get to where they want to be, not because they don't have the talent and the skills and the drive to do it, but because the job search processes are not aligned to, to what they want to do. So my hope is that if you're making a switch or you're going to be in a job change, or you know somebody who is struggling with that, that you really consider this book, because I do think that it'll help people get to where they want to be. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Bye, everyone.